in the middle or end of January of this year, uh, we started our Family Farms Coalition. Um, we were working together with GMO Free Jackson County um, to educate people on this measure. On the Family Farms measure, we're looking for a yes vote for Family Farms. Um, what the, does the measure means and what it says is it prohibits the cultivating and growing of genetically engineered crops in Jackson County. So it doesn't mean that we're going to be a GMO-free county. It means that we're going to have crops that are GMO-free, genetically engineered free. So what this means for farmers is pretty simple. Um, it really protects all the other farmers in the valley who are not growing genetically engineered crops. Let's say in the upper 90, probably 98% of the farming done in, the, in Jackson County is actually already genetically engineered free, the farmers. So what we're asking is to be protected from the genetically injured crops that are primarily being grown by uh, major chemical companies, foreign chem chemical companies coming into our county and growing on our land where it's actually illegal for them to grow in Switzerland. So they're coming here to grow on our land and they're contaminating our crops. And so how does it get contaminated? It gets contaminated by wind and native pollinators. So if somebody grows, um, uh, I grow corn, if somebody grows corn within miles of me, and when the wind comes along and it, uh, crop, and it pollinates, it carries the pollen onto my field of my corn, now my corn is contaminated with this genetically engineered, patented uh, pollen crop. And if I save my seed, which I do, and I sell my seed, now I'm illegally selling and saving my seed because I have now crossed over with a patented crop. And so that's why farmers uh, are standing up saying, this is a going against my property rights. Without my consent and without my will, my crops are being contaminated by a patented crop. So that's why we're really looking for protection. Um, we, it also really risks our ability to sell not only legally, but it also marketability. Um, worldwide, the world is not interested in buying genetically engineered crops. We have some uh, farmer here we will talk about loss um, on his farm. We have many farmers in our county who have already lost contracts for seeds, which is a very, this county is a special place for growing seeds. That's why these big chemical companies want to come here and breed their seeds like Syngenta. They want to breed their seeds because this is a wonderful, special place for seed breeding. But we're saying the people who live here, we want to keep it for our own seed breeding. We don't want to allow this chemical company to contaminate our entire valley and not allow us to have diversity in our seed growing. And I hope you'll get a chance to look in the back room. There's a map, actually. If you could just look back there a little bit. There's a map, and it actually shows the valley. Anna might bring it up here. Um, Thanks. You can be the man of white. <laughs> um, um, so this is a map of our valley, and, and this is the real problem. Um, you know, we talk about, you might not be against genetically engineered science, or maybe even not against genetically engineered crops, but for this valley, it just doesn't work because it's narrow and it's windy, and you can see all of the um, red squares are where currently we know that Syngenta is planting sugar beets. Okay, we'll get up higher so we can see. Yeah. So you can look at it more so you can see an idea. But basically, this shows the contamination rate, those uh, bullseyes. And basically, everywhere we can plant right now will be contaminated by a genetically engineered crop because of Syngenta sugar beets. So this is the reason we can't coexist. Not only the contamination issue, but also the idea that Syngenta, this chemical company, is not willing to work with us as farmers. We have a Southern Oregon a Seed Growers Alliance, we met for months and months to come up with a, a map, pinning, thank you, <laughs> the pinning system so we could see where everyone's growing. And Syngenta walked out of our meetings and said, they sent their lawyer and said, um, we're not going to be transparent with you and tell you where we're growing. So not only are they not willing, they're not being a good neighbor, um, they don't even live here, they, so it's impossible to talk with them. You have to call somebody up in another part of the state to come and hope that you can get one of their chemical representatives. We've also had farmers talk to the chemical company representatives, tell them they're growing, they agreed not to grow, and then they grew, they grew anyways. And so, for instance, a farmer growing all year long, saving their seed for a contract, then finds out they can't even sell their seed, losing their money for the whole year, their work for the whole year. So those are some of the reasons um, I want to talk to you about that. Also, we'll talk about um, the increased use of herbicide with this GE, um, the GE crops that are available. 
Um, when they came out, they were promised to have much more yield, um, less herbicide use. That's not true anymore. Even the USDA came out last year and said there's no higher yield in a genetically engineered crop than there is with conventional. And we have some uh, local people to talk about that. And also the fact that be plants become immune. These weeds that were basically these plants, the difference between genetically engineered patented plants and hybrids is that the reason they're able to patent them is they're different species put together in a laboratory. It's not something natural that happens. It's not a hybrid. It is genes from different species put together in a laboratory so that they're able to patent it. If it was something natural, they wouldn't be able to patent it. These companies are patenting it so they can make a lot of money. That's the reason they're putting $800,000 already into this campaign to scare you and to make you think it's going to cost something. Um, they've done polls to figure out what people care about in our county, and they know that you care about costs. They know that you care about the libraries and the sheriffs and the schools. And so that's what they're using to scare you into thinking this measure costs something. And so I'm just going to end saying, and I can talk more about the measure because it's not really why we're here tonight, but I do want to say something about it, is that um, all the other counties that have measures in place on the West Coast have had zero, if minimal, cost whatsoever. And the reason is, is because you cannot grow a genetically engineered crop without signing a legal document with this uh, major chemical company. So you're saying that the major chemical corporation is going to come in here and break the law? Monsanto or Syngenta, do you think they're going to come break the law when they have so much to lose with the landowner? And then the landowner is going to also have to say, I'm okay breaking the law too. So we've seen, history shows in the other counties where they have a measure, it just doesn't happen. They have too much to lose, so they're not breaking the law. So it just, it's self-governing, it's self-regulating, and they haven't had any problems in any other counties. So I just want to make sure. We also have um, facts on our website and quotes from different um, entities like the librarians who have said this has nothing to do with their funding. So I just want to alert you and be aware, I'm sure you are already, that you're going to be flooded with all kinds of misinformation from these chemical companies trying to confuse you by calling themselves farmers when they're really not the farmers here. They're chemical companies trying to take advantage of our land. So we're really asking for your support. We're now close to 170 farms that have come together. There's hundreds and hundreds of businesses. So we're feeling really good that people here are smart enough to see past this campaign money, but we do need your support in helping spread the word. And hopefully tonight you'll be inspired and maybe surprised and shocked and saddened a little bit by what's happening in other parts of the world and realize um, that we really need to stand up and take some action and, and communicate with our friends and neighbors about it. So without further ado, I want to introduce Miguel Robles. He is um, a wonderful man who has worked on many organizations um, spreading community activism. He's an urban farmer, an artist. Um, he is a founder of the Biosafety Alliance and doing good work all around the world, educating on people on um, important issues like tonight. So he will be our moderator tonight, introducing our other speakers, and then we'll end in a panel and I have questions and answers. So thank you so much. Hey everyone, how are you? Hey. My name is Miguel Robles, I am from Mexico City, but I have been living many years in California. I'm more Californian than Mexican maybe, but still I have the accent from Mexico. <laughs> and, well, I came here because I heard that in Jackson County people is very upset with what's going on with Syngenta and all these companies that are trying to, trying to plant GMO, more GMO, and, it's the, and I think that we, as individuals as citizens or residents so in any way as humans we have to defend the land not only for our people but also we have to defend the environment the thousands of species and plants that that are living along with us in this place so she was talking about the different pesticides and herbicides that this these different companies are spreading out and I think that we have to think about the environmental damage and also our Problems, the problems that we can have in our health. So I, I wonder how many of you know what GMO means? Well, we will have tonight two scientists. They are very, very important scientists. One is from Mexico, Salma Piñero. Another one is Remy Van Damme from, from France. 
he came all the way from France to <laughs> to tonight. So Alma Piñeiro Nelson is trained as a biologist and has focused in studying the development, evolution, and genetics of plants. She has participated in several scientific studies documenting the inadvertent introduction of transgenes into native varieties of corn and cotton in Mexico, a country that is the center of origin of the diversification of both crops. She has been active in the scientific debate and social movement that has opposed the open field introduction of transgenic maize into Mexico and is a founding member of the Mexican non non-profit organization Union, Union of Scientific Union de Científicos Comprometidos con la Sociedad, that in English is the concerned the concerned Union of Scientists. And she is the co-editor of a recent multidisciplinary book addressing the potential negative impacts that the introduction of transgenic corn into Mexico would have at the agricultural, social, cultural and economic level, that is this book. She put together this book that are 40 scientists in this book, 40, 40 different research, and are like 600 pages. This is in Spanish. We are going to start doing some, some presentations in, in the Bay Area to try to raise funds to translate it into English because it's very important information. How many of you speak Spanish? Muy poquito. Muy poquito. Okay. Okay. Well, this book is going to be very soon translated into English because it's, it's, it's very important. Now they are selling it in Mexico because Mexico is the center of origin of corn and also the Mexican government is very corrupted. So it's like just the US, USDA and all these agencies. It's the same in Mexico. They are working for the corporations, not for the people. See? And they are, and they are inventing lies and they, they are doing the same things that they are doing here. But in Mexico, we have a very interesting case because now we have a moratorium mm -hmm. and any kind of corn, uh, uh, regardless it's pilot or commercial or, or experimental crop of corn. So, Alba Piñeiro is going to talk more about it. She's amazing. I am really glad that she took the time because she's doing postdoctoral research in Berkeley now. She, she's going to be in Berkeley for one year. Remy Van Damme, she, he came from Mexico. He's living in Mexico, working in Mexico. And he also was in sabbatic year, but I pulled him to Ashland. He's here. So first we're going to have Alma Piñeiro, and she's amazing. You will see. <laughs> Thank you, I'm very happy to be here. Um, I'm gonna try to be as uh, brief as possible, but also uh, please, if you have specific questions, if you have uh, technical questions, please just stop me and I'll try to address them the best I can because the idea here is to um, give you enough information for you to take an informed decision on what you'd wanna do in this particular uh, bill, which I think is very important for your county. Um, I'm going to start here just by stating something that we already know for the case of Mexico. In Mexico, we have already documented the presence of trans genes in native varieties of corn. Mexico is center of origin of corn and diversification. It harbors 65% of the genetic diversity worldwide of corn. And here, we have already detected trans genes in places they shouldn't be. We have also detected trans genes in native varieties of cotton the cotton that's more, most uh, amply uh, sown everywhere, which is upland cotton, which is the Sipio Nursutum. We are also center of origin, and we also have native varieties that already have transgenes. And what we can put together of our experience, it's what's very clear, is that the idea of having coexistence, this is understood, you can, coexistence between a, a transgenic crop variety and its conventional variety, either just conventionally grown or organic, without eventually having gene flow, is impossible. It goes against what living organisms do, which is interbreed. And plants, as much as animals, can also move. They do not move in the obvious sense, like walking or running or you know, sliding, but they do move, and they move by two important venues, seed flow, and pollen flow. And this is just a question of time, when these plants move from one place to the other. 
So I want to give this like a, a brief introduction just to have this context. Um, whoever tells you the coexistence without transgene flow into conventional varieties is possible if they are sowed in the same physical space. And physical space, I'm talking about a whole county. I'm not talking the same parcel. No? You can sow transgenic varieties and your neighbor can sow conventional varieties and you're eventually going to transfer some of the transgenes you have in your varieties to your neighbors. Maybe not the first year, but it could be the second year, it could be the third year, and that's going to bring problems, uh, which I'm going to briefly address today. Uh, but I want to start with the case of Mexico, because um, as Miguel already said, um, Mexico is one example where there has been a huge struggle to um, stop the introduction of, well, the large-scale introduction of transgenic corn into the country. And it's been a struggle that has been going on for over 10 years. It started in 2001, officially. It has uh, involved lots of people, lots of parts of society. Uh, but so far, we at least have an injunction that uh, impedes the, transgen the, the sowing of transgenic corn so far. We have not won the battle, but this is a very, uh, the whole war, but it's a, this is an important battle that we have already won, and um, it's encouraging. I'll, I'll go over this in a little while. Um, I'm sorry it's a bit blurry, but it's really not, not that important you get to read the things. But I want to put this in, in the middle. Oh, that's yeah, much better. Yeah, I can actually read it. Um, so, uh, Mexico is a, is a very uh, unique country from the biological point of view because it's the center of domestication and, and diversification of a bunch of different uh, crop varieties. I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna read some of them. Uh, this is corn, beans, squash, avocado, tomato, tomatillo, cocoa, vanilla, amaranth, capsicum, pepper, upland cotton, papaya, among others. Um, what's the importance or the relevance of being a center of origin and uh, domestication and diversification? Is that normally you harbor the uh, most diverse um, varieties of a particular crop. And you normally also harbor the uh, wild progenitors of the crop. And both things, both the native varieties and the wild progenitors or uh, relatives, are fundamental to uh, continue doing improvement efforts. You know? So it's very important to uh, sustain this diversity actively. So in the case of corn, which is going to be the subject I'm going to focus on, um, the, the farmers in Mexico have already uh, used the local biodiversity in corn, used agroecological measures and integral biotechnology, which has enabled them to uh, have over 59 different land races, uh, native varieties, and thousands of local varieties that are adapted to different to, to shifts in temperature, to different altitudes, they can be grown even at 7,000 feet above sea level, which is not something common for conventional hybrids. It's, uh, they can uh, grow in different types of soil, they can withstand very high solar irradiation, irradiation. they can uh, grow with um, variable water availability, nutrient avail availability, they have different uh, length lengths in their life cycles, different colors, textures, size, flavors, different uh, protein content, etc. No? And this has been done just with, with agronomical improvement, improvement, such as the one that I'm sure some of you that save seed and save your own uh, crops over the next year are actively doing. You select the best crop of your harvest and you just keep seeds from them and you continue to sow those seeds and you select for whatever trait you find uh, useful, interesting, pretty. So, and this can only be done if you select upon a particular individual species, uh, taking into account all the interplay of all the genes this particular species has. This is what we call integral biotechnology. This integral biotechnology has generated this uh, large abundance of uh, land races in Mexico. All the little black dot, that's the map of Mexico, and all the little black dots that you can see on the map, those are accessions of corn. So if you can see, it spans all over the country, and it is very, very diverse. We also have three of its uh, wild um, 
one of the, well, it's progenitor and it's well relatives. Uh, so basically, corn is all over the country. <coughs> and this in opposition to the other biotechnological, biotechnological approximation, which is the one gene, one trait approach, which is the one that's used in transgenics or GMO varieties. And this is basically uh, a matter of one size fits all. We're going to use one gene, we're going to transform it into different plants, and that's going to basically give us a trait that it's going to be useful for everyone, everywhere, and it's going to be great for plants and for selling and profit. And this actually underlies something I'm just going to briefly uh, acknowledge here, which is genetic determinism, with this is one gene, one trait versus what we already know from science, and we have all the time more evidence and lots of um, agronomical improvements that are truly useful for farmers, and also lots of knowledge just of how, for instance, we have different illnesses that have to do with the interplay of different genes and the environment, lets us to know that actually we have a dynamic genome. And the first approach to genetic determinism, the one gene, one trait, is what is called molecular biology central dogma that was created in the 1950s after the DNA was discovered. And it's remained pretty much unchanged since then, 1960s actually. A couple of French guys proposed in a model where the central dogma came from. And the other, the other uh, um, position is a dynamic genome where uh, not only the genes are important, and the interactions among genes are important, and a gene can actually affect several traits, not one gene, one trait. It can be one gene, several traits. And it can be several genes, one trait. But going back to the one gene, one trait, which is how transgenics are currently done, what we have here is the implementation of genetic determinism, and here I'm just putting a cartoon of, this is a transformation vector. This is what you normally construct in the lab, you can only do transgenics in the lab. You cannot do them naturally because what you're doing is you're splicing and putting together genetic sequences that come from very distantly related organisms such as bacteria, such as viruses, and genes that normally come either from animals or come from other plants that are distantly related from the target plant you want to genetically alter. And you normally what you do is just splice and it's like a copy-paste process where you put, for instance, the vector, which is already an infected bacterium that infects plants, which is agrobacterium. Then you put, for instance, a promoter, which is just going to turn on the whatever gene it has in front all the time, regardless of what the developmental stage is, regardless of what the weather is, regardless of anything. It's just going to be permanently on. And that, is, that comes from a virus that infects cauliflower. It's the mosaic virus cauliflower 3.5S promoter. You have the transgene of interest, which can confer you, say, resistance to glyphosate, or it can confer you the production of insecticide proteins like the Bt proteins. Then you have a terminator that also comes from a, from a bacterium. You put everything in a, in a vector, and what you do is you basically transform plants with that. And this is just like a little uh, example with a brassica relative, which is called Arabidopsis, it's an experimental plant, but it's from the brassica, brassicaceae. What you do is you basically transform the plant, uh, where you see the T1, that's a normal plant, you transform it into the T2, and this can be done by uh, several means, either by infection with a bacterium that's going to transfer this cassette I was talking about, and it's going to be integrated into the genome of the plant, in the case of corn, in the case of uh, wheat and other cultivars, you, you use a shotgun, a molecular shotgun, but you actually cover pellets of gold and tungsten. Uh, the DNA binds to the pellets and then you, you, you just shoot um, callus that's grown in the, in, the, in, in the lab. And you shoot the callus and you kind of pray for the transgene to integrate into the genome and then you select. What it says there, uh, posteriori selection of transgenic lines, is that this is actually a blind selection process. What does this mean? After you get the transgene into your plants with whatever method is useful for the species you're working on, you basically plate them and you put antibiotic to it. And if the plant survives, it means that it's genetically modified. Why if it survives to an antibiotic treatment? Because normally that's the selective uh, gene. So it's not only the transgene, that confers glyphosate resistance or Bt res uh, insecticide production, uh, Bt protein production, it's also they transform it with antibiotic genes. So we're having plants that are actually expressing tolerance to antibiotics, and we're eating that also. No? 
So whatever survives to the antibiotic treatment is then transferred to soil, it's regenerated. Eventually you do conventional crossing and you get a selected line and that's what's sold as a hybrid. It's a hybrid but it's a transgenic. And you remember the, the idea here and why it's uh, so, so successful is because we are assuming that we are going to transfer one or a few genes and we're going to have one and a few traits. And this is going to be integrated into the whole uh, DNA of the plant regardless of whatever is going around in the plant and whatever the, the, um, the DNA context of where the transgene was put in is. And what you're going to expect is you're going to have like the, the plant on the left side and this is close up to this brassicaceae, if you, like, it looks like an arugula flower because they're related. Um, so this is a close up and what you expect is that the plant is going to look normal like the one you see in the, in the left. Uh, it's going to have all the normal structures of a, of a, of a plant, and I'm just ex exemplifying it with a, with a flower. And the only thing is that now it's going to produce a Bt protein, or it's only going to be resistant to glyphosate or to another herbicide or whatever. But what turns out, and it's something that we already know from, from really what's cutting edge biology and genomics, is that normally one gene can actually affect, affect several traits. And what we see here, this is a, an example that's very telling. Lots of people in the biotechnology industry criticize us when we present this because they say that we are being um, um, dramatic about what genetically modified plants are or can have as a phenotype. But this is something that was done in the lab where I worked during my PhD. It's, it's a lab where they do basic biology research and we commonly do transgenics. So it's not being against the transgenic technology just because of per se. It's being against, the, in, in, in my particular case, it's being very critical about how you use it and how you use it when you put it in the open field. Mm. When it's already interacting with the environment, when you're already uh, providing it to farmers. Mm. So what you see in the right panel is actually a sister from the one of the left. Uh, a complete, civ uh, a complete, complete sibling because actually this plant's just self-fertilize. So we're talking about like complete siblings. And what you see here is an aberrant flower where you have flowers within a flower. And it's, I don't know if you get to see that little flower bud that's kind of sticking in the left side of the image. And then you see some petals over there and there's a stamen sticking over there. That is actually, they're genetically identical except for the transgenic construct. And just a, a transgenic construct did this much of difference. And why does this uh, construct did this much of, di of difference? because depending on where the transgene is integrated, it can affect the whole metabolic pathway of a plant. So we're talking about a technology that's pretty powerful, but it's also use it blindly because we don't know where the transgenes are falling. We're just gonna pray they fall in a place where they don't disrupt the normal development of the plant. We're gonna do tests just to see if they have their transgenic use in antibiotic resistant genes or other marker genes and then we're going to select for whatever trait we find interesting and we're going to sell it without any other type of analysis. So as you can see, there's this idea that transgenic technology is very precise, but it isn't precise. The idea is it's really precise because we're only transferring one gene. When you're doing normal cross-breeding, you're actually transferring a bunch of genes from the mother plant to the father plant, well, from the father plant to the mother plant, no? And this is just one gene, but one gene can do all this damage. So, especially, this is in the lab, and what normally happens with plants in the lab like this is you kill them because they are not useful for your experiment, you cannot explain what's going on here, and then you can just turn the page and generate new transgenic plants for your research. That's fine. But the problems really sum up when you think about these plants being transferred into the environment. And what we've been seeing in Mexico is that the uncertainty, insufficiency, and aggregated risk about transgenic plants build up when the plants leave the lab. Because it's not only what we don't know about where the construction is, is getting into the plant, we don't know it's how it's affecting its genome and why sometimes we have perfectly normal plants and why we have some aberrant plants and we don't know why. We don't know how the plant is going to interact with the environment. And also in the case of Mexico and corn, but it's also a case that can be extensive to places like here, we don't know how this is going to actually affect the environment and the socioeconomics and culture of Mexico. Because in the case of corn in Mexico, it's a, it's a stable crop, is what people eat primarily. 
It's little process, it's processed very few, very little, and it is a huge economic crop. So the risks that just kind of showed that they are embedded one inside of the other, just amplify when transgene flow into local land races or local uh, native varieties occur. This is an example, and this is basic, based on, on real biological data from corn and how corn is grown in Mexico. This is a kind of complex um, graphic. I'm going to walk you through it really fast. What we see there is gene flow, no? So, or transgene flow. You can put the same because this is a simulation of transgenes. Um, and you see that when you start with a very, very low frequency of transgenes in a population, that 0.05%, which is very low, um, and you have 15 different sources of seed, some of it's transgenic, some of it isn't. What you can see after several generations, the generations, the... Well, no, actually what you can see is in the um, X and the Y axis, so in the, the, over there on the, on the left, what you see is the number of farmers that eventually have more than 1% of a transgene. And 1% is a telling figure because this is the percent that you're going to, under above 1% of whatever transgenic sequence you ever have in your crop, you're going to have to label it. If you want to, for instance, export to the European Union. If you want to certify it as not transgenic or conventional or organic. And it's also some, above 1% threshold is going to have you... Um, closing up in several markets, both national and international. So 1%, it's very little, but it's enough to get you into a lot of problems. So the number of farmers with over 1% of transgenes, and just depending on how successful this, this transgene is in the population, as you see, it scatters. So eventually you have a bunch of farmers, so you have, you can start 10%, 20%, 30%, 40%, 50%, through time, you're going to end up with a lot of farmers having at least 1% of a particular transgene in their crop. This is thought about, this is thought in the case of Mexico, where lots of people grow corn in the same uh, county, in the same town, and normally uh, the parcels are very close together. No? So this is, this is simulated in the case of Mexico. But this, this can be extensive to several other crops. No? That's why I put it here, because I think it's telling of what can happen. And in the case of Mexico, even when we already had a moratorium to the, to the open field planting of transgenic corn since 1998, by 2001 and then by 2007 and 2008 and 9, we saw that there were transgene presence in native corn varieties in different parts of the country. And so we had some that were here close to the Gulf of Mexico. In Veracruz, you had some that had some of the cry the Bt proteins, then we had some that are resistance to glyphosate all the way to the south. And exactly how that made it into native uh, varieties in Mexico, we still don't know. But this shows, again, that it's not only about declaring a moratorium, it's also about taking care of what you introduce to a particular uh, place, a country, a county, etc. In the case of Mexico, this transgene flow uh, is I put this title, Sharing States and Sharing Problems, is because you cannot get out of it easily. Um, the genetic, because, and it's fundamental in the case of Mexico, because the genetic diversity of Mexico is actively maintained by uh, seed sharing practices. No? So people, people in Mexico have their native varieties, and commonly a farmer will, will exchange seeds with a fellow farmer, sometimes from the same communities, sometimes from communities apart, because they're interested, as any farmer is, to you know, experiment with other varieties that look attractive, that have pretty colors, that grow well under certain conditions. And that's how you transfer genes, no? interchanging, exchanging um, seeds with other farmers. And this is a normal practice, and this is a <coughs> fundamental practice. I just want to say something. I'm not saying that you have to avoid doing this. No, this practice all around the world is what really actively maintains genetic diversity. This is what is going to give you the livelihood of your crops, is eventually introducing some genetic diversity into your particular cultivars. And this can have a very important problem. This already has important problems in Mexico because as it was already mentioned at the beginning, uh, transgenic varieties and their transgenes themselves are patented. So they're owned by corporations. So that means that if they eventually appear in your harvest, in your cultivar, you are susceptible to be uh, demanded by patent infringement. And this is 
it doesn't matter if you did it willingly, knowingly, or it just got there because there was transgene flow and you didn't know about it. Additionally, something I'm not going to talk a lot here because I want to, I, I want to engage with you and, and you know answer whatever specific questions you have is. Um, we know that the introduction of transgenes into corn in particular, corn is a very unstable crop from the genetic point of view. It's, it's great, it gives a lot of seed, it's a great uh, commodity, it's a great uh, nutritional crop, but from the genetic point of view and the genomic point of view, it's pretty unstable. So when you introduce transgenes, you have additional problems and you can get more uh, like aberrant morphologies in corn if you introduce transgenes. The other thing is something that's already, there's mounting evidence, is that if you introduce one transgene and that transgene is being um, expressed in the plant, that means you're producing a new recombinant protein, it's actually going to change what the plant can actually produce. And if you think about it, plants, animals, we are all, if you, see, if you use a meta meta metaphor of a machine, we are closed machines. We have a, a reduced number of elements we can take in and a reduced number of elements we can produce out. That's the same case with the plants. So if now the plant is allocated resources to produce an new transgenic protein, that means it's going to take resources from something else. And that has also already been proved. And in the case of Mexico, but also in the case of people that are saving their seeds generation after generation, whatever negative effect that transgene can have in a plant, it's just going to be amplified after several generations. Because you, what you're going to do without even knowingly is increasing the chance of increasing the frequency of, your, of a transgene in your crop. And something that's really important to note here is transgenic plants cannot be visually differentiated from non-transgenic plants. That is impossible. They don't have a different color, they don't have a different shape, they don't have a different growth cycle. So that means that even if you wanted to clearly distinguish them, clearly pull out whatever are uh, new transgenic plants that you have because of gene flow from a neighbor, you are not going to be able to do it. You can only detect them with molecular techniques that are expensive and that you need technical experience to use so far. And Something that I'm also not going to go into detail um, is there's an increasing body of evidence that consuming transgenic corn, or in particular, but also cotton, because we eat it in, as as uh, as oil, cotton oil, is not good for you. No? It's associated with different health problems. And these problems can be shared between transgenic and conventional varieties of other cultivars because we know that there's trans, uh, there's gene flow if you put one type of beet in one place and you put another type of beet, the seeds can move. It can happen in wheat, it can happen in alfalfa, it can happen in different brassica species. All these, the, the plants I'm putting here, they're all documented. It's not like I'm just kind of saying, no, you know, this could also be a problem. And as I said at the beginning, coexistence of transgenic cultivars and non-transgenic cultivar without gene flow is unrealistic, especially at close distances. So it's just a question of time uh, before it happens, before you have transgenes into your uh, crops or before you transfer those transgenes from your transgenic crop to the neighbors who's growing a conventional one. We put, in the case of Mexico, we, we put the book, wrote a big book trying to put all the evidence of why it was problematic in Mexico. We, we did it here, I'm sorry, it's in Spanish. We're trying to get it translated. Um, but I think this is something that would be really good if it could be done in, US, in the US. Another important point is there's a lot of uh, people saying, you know, there's no evidence of risk. There's no evidence of anything. But the thing is that there's no evidence because it's never been studied. And among things of why they haven't been studied is because in the case of the U.S., you cannot study transgenic cro uh, crops, whatever, corn, beets, alfalfa, without patent infringement problems. You have to get the corporations to sign on your project and say that they are willing to give you both the transgenic corn for uh, crop for experimentation. But normally, what corporations do under those type of contracts is to impede the researcher from making their research, their research um, and experiments public, if they show data that it's not good for them. So, in the case of Mexico, it's very clear that given the nested risks of transgenic corn varieties in Mexico, 
What we have been fighting for is a countrywide ban on the use of this particular biotechnology in this particular crop. I'm not going to go through the whole different years of struggle in Mexico, but it has been going on for over 13 years, and we are going places. But I, I think something important to, to highlight here is that the struggle, in the case of Mexico, but it's something that I, I think it's important to think in the, in the U.S. context and in the context of this particular county, is that the struggle against the introduction of corn, transgenic corn in Mexico, it's political in several ways, and I'm going to use the word political, knowing that it's normally associated with a bunch of politicians that are just ugly. <laughs> but I'm not, yeah, but it's political in the best sense of policy, in the sense that it claims sovereignty over what we sow, how we sow it, that we want to keep our traditional systems because those traditional systems are good, because the native varieties are actually better and competitive with hybrids because we want to be able to decide what we eat. If we, in the case of Mexico, enable the introduction of transgenic corn into the country and it's grown in the country, we're going to be left with that option of what we want to eat. It's all going to be transgenic eventually. And that's a big problem. And the other thing that we, and, and what's also involved in this particular struggle, is that we want to have this claim sovereignty on the production of sufficient and healthy food for the entire population and we want to be able to use agricultural practices that are environmentally and socially sustainable. So this is, it, that's why lots of different groups have come together in Mexico. And I know that Mexico seems pretty far away, and it seems like a country-specific problem, but I want to just highlight some couple of points that, that, that bring it home. And it's that transgenic corn introduction in Mexico will affect you here in the U.S., in several ways. One, hindering the exchange of transgene-free seed, trans seeds, in case you want it. Again, Mexico has 65% of the whole genetic diversity reserve of corn in particular, but also as you saw, other cultivars that are important, tomato, tomatillo, you're not going to be able to grow cocoa here or vanilla, but I'm, I'm sure everybody likes chocolate. No? Um, um, it's also going to affect the available genetic diversity necessary for maize improvement in worldwide. You know? So even if you're not particularly interested in a particular heirloom variety from Mexico just because it's pretty, aside of it's being pretty or interesting, it's actually the, 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 the basis for genetic improvement everywhere. You know? And the other thing that's it's going to be a big problem is going to increase the hunger and stability in Mexico. And just imagine what's going to happen if we have a big hunger um, process in Mexico. We're neighbors, you know, we share a really big uh, part of the border. border. And something that's for sure going to be affected is that it's greatly going to reduce your right to choose what you sow and what you eat. What has helped in the Mexican context? Grassroots organization from peasant groups, from farmer groups, from non-governmental organizations, and also from scientist co coalitions. So there's been several scientists, uh, which I have been very fortunate to work with, that are top-level scientists, they're the best ranking in the country, they have great curriculums, they've been awarded here in the US, they've been awarded in Mexico, so they are, they're really good scientists in themselves, but they're also worried about the integrity of the country and integrity of the farming system, and they have really done research that highlights some of the risks and uncertainties of this technology. And that has been very important to, put, to provide information no? and to try to clarify some things and to also test, you know, is this a problem, is not a problem, why? With this, we have been able to exert public pressure and we have been able to generate information, outreach and active research. And something that I think has helped this movement is the shared notion that life and living organisms should not be susceptible of being patented. No? This is what, with what I wanted to finish. Uh, thank you all for hearing me. I hope I was clear enough. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so we're going to have questions right now, maybe three questions. And at the end, we're going to have other more questions after we really speak. So if you want to raise your hand, if you have any questions, we're going to have three now. Anyone has a question? Yeah. I'm interested in the economic impact of the ban in Mexico. Has it improved the economy or 
had a negative effect? Actually, the, uh, that's a good you brought it up. It has not affected the economy so far because officially we have never been able to sow transgenic corn in Mexico. And this is important. This is an important point that I think it's important in Jackson County in the sense that we have not we have done research and we found transgenes where they shouldn't be, but they're localized. We can still control them, and they're still not a countrywide pro, pro, uh, problem. They will be if we have large-scale plantings of transgenic corn in Mexico. That's for sure. But the economic impacts have been minimum because so far we have been able to stall the large-scale planting of transgenic corn in Mexico. And I think that given our experience, it's pretty clear that it's easier to go ahead and ban the use of a particular technology or the use of a particular transgenic cultivar in a particular part of the country than trying to put like band-aids on whatever happens later. That's what we want to do. We don't want to have any more economical impact. Mexico is already uh, self-sufficient in production of corn for human consumption. We do import a, a good amount of yellow corn for uh, father to Mexico, but that's not consumed by the population. Um, so we have had no impact. What we have want to do with this measure is to avoid any other impact. Because what's very clear, and I actually have asked people of Monsanto, representatives in Mexico, which is Monsanto's biggest, it's like, so is like the little sister of Monsanto, Monsanto's the really big guy, no? Yeah. I've asked people in, Mex in uh, representatives, what's going to happen if a small-scale a small farmer, like the majority of Mexican farmers in the south part of the country, uh, eventually uh, has transgenes in his or her native varieties? You know, are you going to demand them? because of patent infringement, because of you're going to be able to trace if that's your technology? Well, no, we wouldn't demand them, no? But of course, it was just like hand-waving, no? We wouldn't demand them, of course, just in, we wouldn't demand them in case they just only, you know, use the seeds for self-nourishment, self or if they barter. I said, okay, so if you sell, what's going to happen? If they want to sell their seed, you know, they want to sell part of their harvest, their farmers, makes sense. Well, that's a different idea. Yeah, and um, I'm curious to know what the most effective uh, way has been to reach the politicians to where they actually take action on behalf of the people. In the case of Mexico, and this is again because this is a national uh, issue, and it's been in different states within Mexico, not all politicians are the same. The majority have some really striking features, but not all are the same. I think two things, information, Lots of politicians don't even know what the GMO is. It's because GMOs are difficult to understand sometimes, especially if you don't have anything to do with agriculture, then it's even more abstract. No? If you don't know how a plant grows, then trying to understand how a plant is modified is even harder. So information, just educating the politicians. You know, This is the GMO, this is what we're going to do. This is a transgenic corn is going to be this, and it has this implications for the case of Mexico. So information has been important. The other thing that has been really important is, is public pressure. Public pressure. I think something that's been very important for some politicians is informing, uh, conducting research that shows that we do have objective risks under this technology, and also conducting public pressure that in the case of Mexico it makes it very politically costly to their careers if they put forward this technology. If they are the ones that sign the treaty that says, okay, yeah, no, we're going to get all the transgenic corn. So public pressure is important and, and you can only get public pressure if you have a united front. No? Any other question? The last one. Um, I, I noticed you were showing me uh, the deformed flower. Yes. And uh, uh, what have you had any do documentation at the human level on birth defects or anything else like that that could potentially be linked to transgenic? There, there is, so the, in the case of the transgenic, of the flower, those are flowers that were genetically modified directly, no? Yes. So they were subject to genetic transformation, right. which is something that we fortunately humans are not subject to in, you know, direct way. Uh, nevertheless, there is mount evidence of health effects of consuming transgenic uh, crops. Uh, through two particular issues. If you're, uh, there's evidence that if you consume crops that express BT genes, the CRY1, AB, CRY2, CRY9 uh, proteins, 
It can be a really potent allergen. It can increase your allergy levels. It can also generate more um, um, bowel syndromes, especially in people that already have had surgery in their uh, stomach. So they are weak in their stomach. They have increasing syndromes. The Bt protein itself can also be allergenic and it can generate rashes. No? Um, now, in the case of the uh, crops that are tolerant to glyphosate, the way where you can put glyphosate as a herbicide and it won't kill your crop, there's even uh, there's more information, more evidence that the glyphosate <coughs> itself can generate uh, more um, physical deformities uh, in developing embryos. It has obviously not been tested directly in humans, but it has been tested in different model systems. And you can see that there's genetic defects, and this has to do with the glyphosate effect in some of the um, of the genetics that go on when you're forming a new um, being, especially a vertebrate. No? So you have one single eye, you can get like the uh, neural cord doesn't really close. Um, those are, have already been tested. It can also affect water organisms. This is the environmental part, but it can also affect water organisms. Glyphosate was once uh, promoted as a biodegradable. It isn't. It's persistent in the soil. And another thing is that glyphosate, uh, the way the, the, the chemical formulation of glyphosate, all the things they put in the, into the Roundup Ready, it's done so the plant absorbs the glyphosate. So you cannot wash it off. It's inside the plant. Um, and uh, I don't know. I'm, I think that's. Uh, there's also been studies that are, are inconclusive because they have to be done in a better, more extended system, including more test animals. But there are studies that clearly correlate the presence of glyphosate. Um, either you eat it in, in your, when you eat it in your vegetables, once again you cannot wash it off because it's internal. It has been correlated with a, a higher incidence in cancer especially in uh, older individuals. Isn't, isn't, yes. isn't it true uh, last year the United States Department of Pediatrics came out and said glyphosate is not safe for children? Yes. And also the uh, Environmental College of, uh, the, the College of, I always get it, get it wrong, the Association of, Environment of Environmental Physicians, Doctors, the U.S., it's, it's from the U.S., said that with the available evidence on glyphosate, they did not recommend eating transgenic crops. So this was a big official statement from this association of environmental uh, physicians. So you, you mean uh, genetically engineered or GMOs when you yeah. say transgenic? Yes, genetically engineered or, or GMOs. I'm using them as, uh, as the same thing. Yes. I have heard that the, uh, some of the data that Monsanto came out with about the level of glyphosate I can't say the word glyco glyphosate. Uh-huh. Um, that 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 level is not static as the crop grows. That it it absorbs that those glyphosates. Yes. And then that level when it's a uh, younger like say corn, if they were to test immature corn, it would have a certain level, mm -hmm. and then by the time it gets to marketable state, the level of that, because it's cumulative in that crop, mm -hmm. that, that it's kind of misleading by Monsanto to say that it remains it's at constant. a safe level because the data they used was from a younger, not the market where most crop would be sold. Yes, when you use glyphosate in a crop and you do several rounds of roundup use, that means that your crop is going to accumulate glyphosate. Because once again, it's designed so you can absorb it, but your particular GM crop or transgenic crop is not going to die off it. But it's going to absorb it and it's going to accumulate it. So that's true. And yes, several of the studies conducted by Monsanto and other, both like in glyphosate accumulation and also in um, testing if it was uh, it had any health effects, were conducted and were done in such a manner that they just wanted to see if there was acute, let's say really strong toxicity in a very short time period. So like if they were toxic in the more immediate sense, 
But what they didn't do, because it, what, it didn't serve their purposes, was to do a lifelong test to see how it affects a living organism, an animal, during its whole life cycle. And that's what some of the studies that are already trying to cover the possible effects of glyphosate during the whole life cycle of, uh, of data with rats, obviously, has shown that you have an increased likelihood of, of having cancer, you have an increased likelihood of having liver problems, and, and they are significant, they're higher than in the non-treated rats no? with glyphosate. Thank you so much. Sorry. We have time for more questions. This is the kind of beautiful brains that are fit with organic corn in Mexico. <laughs> <laughs> so the next speaker is is Remy Van Dam. And Remy Van Dam is a He, he has been working in different positions in Mexico. Most of his work has been in, he's from France, but he has been studying in Mexico and working in Mexico. And he's a, a bee ecologist. I don't know if you know people who are working with bees, beehives. Oh. And he has been studying multiple kind of <laughs> bees. Today we have a, a walk in the, in the mountains and he, he was explaining to us the different kind of bees that there are everywhere. It's, it's amazing, all the information that this guy has. So, please. Okay, thank you, Miguel, and uh, hello, everybody. Uh, it's very nice to be here with you, with you today. And uh, yes, as Miguel told, uh, today we had a work in the mountains around here and it's a very nice region you, you are living in so we enjoy very much to be, to be here with you and it's good that you are willing to, to save and to defend the beauty, the beauty of this region. So um, I'm going to talk to you also, well, uh, as Miguel told, I, I am uh, originally French, uh, living in Mexico for 20 years, so I will probably have a uh, uh, French Mexican accent in my English. <laughs> I, I hope you will understand anyway. Um, in Mexico, I am with my uh, group of people, we are working on bees, uh, bees ecology. And what what does it matter in the, into the genetically uh, modified crop debate? Basically, because um, people defending uh, GM crops. It says that it's just a matter of coexistence. So you should. Uh, can you just leave one light? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, people defending the GM crop they, they say that well, you should just respect the distance of 20 or 100 uh, meters or some yards between uh, GM uh, crop and non-GM crop. And then you can have uh, coexistence if you keep a uh, certain distance. And as Alma has been explaining, this is wrong because uh, we know that the gene flow is going is, uh, on a long distance. So we, you will ha always have some contamination of uh, GM uh, to non-GM crops. But this is also true uh, with different activities, different productions, like the honey production. And this is why I want to show that uh, the con contamination of honey is happening at a very long distances from uh, GM mm -hmm. um, So first to understand, you must take into account the importance of bees in Mexico. Mm -hmm. uh, you can see on the upper left, um, it's, uh, it's part of the Codex Madrid, which is a document of the Mayan people from the 13th century. And this shows how these people were managing the, the business, the native bees in Mexico, and they are still working the same way uh, quite today. And on the bottom we have the uh, front of three bees, um, the black one which is a bubble bee, the green one is a, uh, an orchid bee, so the bees that are visiting, visiting uh, orchid flowers. On the, on the right is a stingless bee, the, the bees that are managed by, traditionally in Mexico. So these bees are part of the close to 2,000 species of bees we have in Mexico. So Mexico is a, has a, a strong diversity of bees and very old tradition uh, with uh, managing bees. 
In the 16th century, Spanish people introduced to Mexico the European bees, Apis mellifera, which you, you have also here for honey production. And this bee uh, has, been, uh, has become important for Mexico, and it makes that Mexico is now the third country for honey exportation at the world uh, scale. Uh, so the first country for honey exportation is China, then Argentina, and then Mexico. Uh, most of this honey is going to, uh, to Europe, to the European Union. So this was about this. Now about GM. Um, so uh, I won't uh, read, uh, take again all the arguments of, of the GM debate, but uh, since for the last 15 years there is a very strong debate about uh, GM crops, and in particular in Europe, uh, this debate has made that um, today, if you, want, if you are selling food and in a, any single food, you have one ingredient that is uh, mainly GM, uh, genetically modified. You should label the, the food. So if it is, say, uh, chocolate with uh, soy, soy lecithin, and this soy lecithin is mainly uh, GM, uh, you should label the chocolate as containing uh, GM ingredients. So this is happening uh, nowadays in, uh, in Europe. Um, in 2011, 2011, um, the European uh, Union Court of Justice decided that uh, this law was applying also to honey. So it means that um, if into honey you have uh, GM pollen, uh, the honey should, should be labeled as honey containing uh, GM pollen. Um, well, when, you, when you see the honey, you don't realize that uh, there is al always quite a lot of pollen into honey. So you, you can extract the pollen and make an analysis of this pollen, uh, of the honey, and uh, you will see that this pollen uh, is uh, uh, from a genetically modified plant. Actually, right now, if 0.9% uh, if, uh, of the pollen of the honey is GM, is uh, genetically modified, you should label uh, this, this honey as containing GM pollen. This is how it works nowadays in, in Europe, in the European Union. So this, uh, this is not a big problem for European beekeepers because in Europe you have very few, very few uh, GM crops. But it's a problem for beekeepers in Mexico because uh, there is uh, more and more GM crops. Um, here, the, the, on this map of Mexico, you can see in uh, in yellow, green, and red the states, uh, all these in the south of Mexico, the states with high number of beekeepers. In red, you can see the states with more than four thousand beekeepers, quite a lot, quite a high number. And the red circles are the uh, places where uh, GM soybean is actually uh, produced. So, um, especially in the Yucatan Peninsula, which is uh, at the uh, far right on, on the map, um, the Yucatan Peninsula is a place where you have plenty of beekeepers and also a lot of GM soybean. A lot of GM soybean is relative. It's about uh, 20 or 30,000 hectares, so I don't know how much in hectares it would be. Uh, well, I couldn't make the translation. But, uh, so 50,000 hectares. 50,000 hectares. So it's still not that much. Um, however, uh, there is a big overlap between uh, honey production and uh, GM soybean. So, there, there has been by then a strong concern of Mexican beekeepers saying that, well, uh, is our honey going to be contaminated with GM pollen and uh, will, uh, will the exportation to Europe uh, be uh, prohibited? To, to try to understand what was happening, we have been into the soybean crops. Um, Monsanto specifically and uh, uh, official, uh, the, the federal government were telling, well, there is no problem because the bees are not visiting soybean. And the first thing we, has, we have seen is that this is a soybean flower, <laughs> and it's uh, GM soybean. And 
you have bees visiting, plenty of bees visiting. So the, the argument of the of Monsanto and the, the, the state were absolutely wrong, and it was very easy to, to show they were, they were wrong. So it's, it was quite amazing to, to realize how basic arguments they are, or how basically they were lying. Um, and then we wanted to know how far of the soybean crops um, the bees were visiting the soybean flower and how far the, the honey would be contaminated. So for, for this, in green you have a soybean uh, plot and uh, different apiaries are uh, to one and a half mile uh, from the crop. And uh, we have been taking honey samples from the, from the different uh, apiaries uh, to cross to, to miles. And we made an analysis of the, of the honey. And we wanted just to see how, uh, how much uh, GM's uh, pollen we would find into honey. So overall, um, well, it's a bit complicated, I won't enter into detail, but we found that uh, up to two, two kilometers, which, in, which is one and a half mile of the soybean crop, 95% uh, of the samples of honey were containing GM crop. Wow. Uh, sorry, uh, were containing soybean uh, pollen, GM so soybean uh, pollen. So it means that uh, at a circle uh, of two kilometers, close to two miles from uh, the apiaries, uh, beekeepers would be affected by the GM uh, soybean. So uh, we are showing here that the coexistence is not that easy uh, to, to gain. Uh, uh, people are saying, well, just do that and the coexistence is easy. It's just uh, lying. So back to, <laughs> back to the Yucatan Peninsula. Uh, this is a map of the Yucatan Peninsula, which is the southeast of Mexico. We know that uh, in this area we have about 15,000 beekeepers. Which, mean, which means probably 15,000 apiary or, uh, or much more. If you take each apiary and draw a circle of two kilometers of radius, you get that. Mm -hmm. So all the territory is covered by bees of the beekeepers. So wherever you put any soybean, uh, GM soybean crop, there will be uh, bees of the beekeepers visiting the soybean. Um, Actually, this is, uh, we can see that from another perspective. This is, um, Intertech is a German lab which is making uh, analysis of honey ent uh, entering to, to the European Union. And what they have found in, tw uh, in 2012 is that honey from Argentina uh, into 29% uh, of the honey were containing uh, GM pollen. And this is because Argentina has uh, 50 million acres of soybean, of GM soybean. Mm -hmm. So when you have a lot of GM soybean, most of the honey is contaminated by uh, GM pollen. In Mexico still, the, the, there is pretty few soybean, and so it's only 1% of the honey that's still con contaminated. So just as the case for uh, corn, it's still possible for Mexico to revert the situation, stop the GM soybean plantation, and save the honey uh, production and the honey market and uh, the, the beekeepers' uh, families. Um, well, maybe just one picture to illustrate the, the movement that, that's happening in Mexico. This is an archaeological site, a Mayan site in, the, in Yucatan. And you have people there, uh, plenty of people, uh, forming the letters ma ogeme, which means uh, no to GMOs. And uh, this is to illustrate that uh, beekeepers uh, and plenty of people, uh, their families and more people in the, in the southeast of Mexico now are struggling very much against uh, GM crops. And uh, finally, the, um, there is a sort of uh, informal and uh, very spontaneous co coalition between beekeepers cooperatives, traders, um, uh, researchers of the universities, and 
all the time crossing information, trying to find a way to convince uh, everybody that GM, GMOs is, are not the future for Mexico. And the beekeepers have been to the court uh, and they uh, could demonstrate to the, to the, in the, into the court of justice in Mexico that uh, the consultation, the public consultation that uh, should have been done for, uh, before permitting GM crops, uh, GM soybean, uh, the consultation was uh, not done in the terms of the, of the law. And um, the judge uh, accepted the argument and so uh, the beekeepers won. And uh, one month ago, or a little bit more, uh, the GM soybean uh, plantations have, have been suspended in Mexico. Yeah. So this is always a situation now with uh, uh, plenty of people struggling, struggling on the side, on one side, and uh, well, I mean, still the government defending uh, the, the big companies. Um, so as a uh, conclusions, I would say, well, first, looking into honey, you can see what's happening into the, the landscape, into the area. Um, we found that uh, GM soybean uh, can be found into honey at uh, up to two kilometers, about one and a half, one and a half mile of the, of the soybean crops. Um, after all, the coexistence is not only a matter of uh, corn growers or cotton growers. It's, all, it's a matter of all the all the farmers, of all the community, of all the people, and also of the people who are, who are going to, to be eating the, the GM food. Um, well, and finally, as, as a, a good conclusion, is that uh, collective action uh, involving all the sectors, uh, farmers. Uh, uh, NGOs, um, um, researchers, um, scientists, uh, the, this collective action can be very powerful and can really uh, stop the bad decisions that, that has been taken. And I think it's very important that here you are, uh, all of you, um, uh, having this discussion on do, do we want GMOs or not. This is how the decision should be taken. Thanks for your attention. Uh, so the most important <coughs> genetically engineered crops are the ones that are annuals or biannuals. And that has to do with the practical restriction of the technology. In order to genetically engineer something that it's a perennial and a woody species like, like, a, a, tree. like a tree, you would have to conduct like 15 years of research just to get the first transgenic line. So you don't have genetically engineered uh, pears, you don't have genetically engineered apples, you don't have uh, genetically engineered wine, uh, wine uh, grapes. 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 Well, now we uh, have the problem with the apple that they were introducing in Washington, right? But it's very well known that everyone will avoid it because just because it will never get rotten, you know. So who want to eat something like that? No, it, it, it's against themselves. They are working against it. But I don't know if there are more questions about the missile. In the back. Great. Great. You're getting this gift. Get it? Oh. Uh, <coughs> papaya tree. Papaya tree. Papaya is a tree. Thank you. Because papayas are if it's genetically engineered. In fact, the majority of the papaya fruit that come from Hawaii right yeah, now genetic are genetically engineered. engineered. Mm -hmm. So let's be honest about what we're talking about here when we start throwing these facts and figures around. Let's be honest with people about this, the whole scenario. I understand your feelings on this, but I don't think you're being totally open with everybody. First of all, there are only eight species of plants that are uh, genetically engineered in the United States. How I agree with you on the corn that you have in Mexico. What a resource if it's if it's real. I understand that. And how you got genetically engineered pollen down there is because somebody put, took some corn from here, put it in their pocket, and took it home and then planted it. So let's be let's be truthful about that. Uh, I don't know how your government works in Mexico. But I can tell you, to stand in front of me and tell me that my Department of Agriculture and my government people are all crooked 
and in bed with those people, I can tell you, you are dead wrong. Because he is a government employee. I was a government employee. I know hundreds of them, and they're hardworking, honest, reliable people who do the best that they can do. Don't ever come here and tell me that my government, the people who work for my government, are bad, crooked, at taking money under the table. Now, I am a family farmer. And this proposed ordinance here is going to have a direct impact on my ability to farm in the future. Because I don't know, and neither do you, none of you know, what science is going to come out in the future with that may make me a better farmer, produce better crops, maybe a perennial crop that was an annual but now it's a perennial. <coughs> you don't know what's going to come out. But if I pay, you pass this law, this ordinance, that is a closed door. I cannot so, do that in okay. the future. Well, I'd like to answer that question. A disclaimer. Can I have a disclaimer? Yes. I am a citizen too. This is my country. This is my government. And I have read a lot of information about all the corruption from the USDA and the correlation that there is with Monsanto. And it's the same with my... I was born in Mexico, and I, I know that many people here know that the Monsanto is working very close with the government in Mexico doing the same thing that they are doing here. So I am not lying, and this is, this, is, okay. this, is, this, is, so, this is public. So either either way, I think we can all agree that there's bad and good people in any organizations, right? Um, one thing I want to address with you as far as the science of genetically engineered crops, I am in total alignment with you that the science is just not out there yet, right? We don't really know, and I don't feel comfortable as a farmer and a landowner here to be a testing plot for the science experiment. And so what this ordinance and measure does allow is it allows for scientific experiments in a contained area, which is how it should be. I read the, and I read so, the ordinance. How many right. people in here have read the ordinance? So, yeah. So the thing is, this, this will allow for that. What we're saying is no matter what, if you or somebody else grows a genetically engineered crop, it will cross-contaminate with, with other fields. And so we are now all in this scientific experiment. And most people in this valley who are growing are not willing to do that. We're not willing to Wait, give up uh, our rights. Uh, not so, most. Yes, actually. No, yes. not most. Actually, six people, six people on the supporter list for the no are actually local residents. Everybody else is out of the county. So yes, most. Yes, most. No, no, most. Does anybody have another question? I, I yeah. have a comment. I would like Alma to address this idea of government collusion, uh, dishonesty is the way he said it, by uh, relating what you said last night about the fast tracking of the GMO of yes. Yes, I just, uh, I agree, yes, papaya is genetically modified and it was important in Hawaii for a papaya virus you know, that was affecting uh, papaya in, in Hawaii. It's starting to have other problems there. You know, it's also generating resistance to some other uh, insects in Hawaii. So it's uh, one of the problems in general with genetically modified crops, and that's just part of the technology, is that if you generate a crop that is resistant to a particular pathogen, the virus, uh, insect, eventually the populations of that pathogen are going to evolve to be resistant. That's, that, that's something that happens naturally in, in nature. <coughs> so um, it's just something important to bear in mind because, yes, transgenic technology can be very powerful, but it's not going to be a long-term fix to agricultural problems. I think that's something to bear in mind, and yes, you're totally right, papaya is a, it's a, it's a tree, but it's not a woody species. Woody species take a much longer life cycle, and that's why there's very few that are still modified. The other thing is that there are more than eight uh, genetically modified crops uh, approved. They are not sowed in large scale, but there's over 15, and there's a very good, um, a very good uh, independent uh, from the government, but also independent from um, you can provide me with a source. Yes. Because all yes. the sources that I have, <coughs> repeatedly, including mm -hmm. the Department of Agriculture, it's say there are eight. Yes, it's so. www.agbios.com. Ag what? 
A G B I O S, Agbius. Uh, it's a very good resource. It's it's also worldwide, and it gives you a good. But it, but it's you can look it for country by country, and you can see in what the United it's, States, in the United States. States. Yeah. We're gonna give a chance to uh, other people. So. Yes, yeah, the other I, thing about. Uh, I would like to say one thing about from what I hear you saying is that you said that science is not there yet, but you don't know what GM crops and science and technology will bring to make you a better farmer. True. Is that true? That's true. Okay, you don't know, if you don't know that it won't make you a better farmer if it's banned, then how do you know it will make you a better farmer if it's allowed to go on? Because, you know, let me tell you something. When I was 19, I got sent to Vietnam and, and, and Monsanto sprayed Roundup I mean, Agent Orange, and they said it wouldn't harm our troops. It would just defoliate the forests. It took them 30 years to admit that it does have a significant impact on human health, and it did do that. Now, I submit to you that you don't know that we're not going to be hearing the same thing about this Roundup that we're eating that's being shoved down everybody's throat by people that are buying into the cheaper big agribusinesses that can come into a valley and say, we want to coexist. Well, I tell you what, if you take traditional crops and grow them, they won't kill Roundup crops, the Roundup Ready crops, but your crops that you grow that's Roundup Ready will kill their crops. Whoa, wait a minute. And how you do you get? You made a jump that ain't there, dude. No, First of all, Excuse me, this is not a discussion between two people. We, we brought people to speak and we would like the public to ask questions. Please be este, more gentle. We have first here the, the lady, please. Okay, you first, you first. I have two questions. Okay. Do you need any no, here behind. Behind. We can have somebody behind. Okay. Uh, I, I wanted just to address okay. the comment um, regarding uh, the USDA or in the case the fast where I, the fast tracking. Uh, let's be very clear, and I think I can talk both for the Mexican case and for and, and some instances for the U.S. case. There is very um, moral, very good scientists in both sides that are working for the government. And they are top-notch scientists. Uh, some of the leading scientists in the case of Mexico are agronomists that have worked for the Mexican government for over 40 years. And they are... Um, great persons, great scientists, they have already done uh, lots of things uh, uh, that have improved agronomy in Mexico. And that's the same case in the U.S. In the USDA, there's also good people. What it's also true, and this is documented, there was very good people that had very strong concerns about the potential dangers of introducing in a large scale within the, the U.S. Uh, transgenic crops. Uh, saying that this technology was very powerful but it was still untested and or sufficiently tested and it was going to be introduced widely in the country and those scientists got shot. So they are good people, they are good scientists but they were going against the current and they also got shot. No? I am not saying that everybody in the government is corrupt, neither here nor in Mexico. There is people that I'm sure that are corrupt, like I'm any sure place, like any place. No, uh, I would not... Uh, but what, what's important is that this giant scientist, American scientist, <coughs> that put their word out there saying, you know, this technology is still ungaranted. We still need to make more test tests. I am not comfortable with the tests that are being submitted by the companies, by Monsanto, by Syngenta, by Bayer, by others that already were merged into, the, into this last three companies. I think there has to be more research. You know, we have to think in the, in, in the, in the wellness of our population in the United States. I would like to know what the cost to this county will be if we pass this uh, I'd like to speak on that. Um, so the biggest thing to look at is the language that the county has discretion on whether to enforce this or not. So the county can choose to do absolutely nothing, so, which means there's no cost at all. Um, farmers feel really comfortable with that because we've seen in other counties that people do not grow and get contracts for genetically engineered crops when it's illegal. You have to sign a 14-page legal document 
no big corporation is going to take that risk, and we've seen it happen 10 years now in other counties, it's been, these uh, measures have been in place. So we feel really comfortable with that. So there will be no cost at all, as long as the county doesn't, we don't have to do anything about it. We just look at history and tell us. Um, but what if, what if that's not true? Um, that, you know, the corporations have put so much into fighting this already. Um, what would stop them from going ahead and just growing anyways, just to, just to push the issue further and to maybe, you know, get it into um, a court of appeal because they know that that will cost our county and maybe that will give us some leverage. So, so again, so, so again, I mean, this is, we're just kind of theorizing that no corporation or no farmer would dare to, to grow the GMOs at this point. Do but you, maybe they would just to further the issue. Do you think Syngenta would find somebody here to sign a legal contract with to break that law? I think if they were paid the, if you came in those stuff? Yeah, if they were paid their the right amount. I mean, what's the right to be to be breaking the law? Yeah, because what's what's the fine for growing a GMO crop? Maybe Syngenta says, hey, you go ahead and plant this, and we'll pay you fifty thousand dollars. Syngenta is both 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 parties remember breaking the law, right? Sure, sure. So then the county doesn't have to have any cost. So it won't be the county can say we don't care. Please. Yeah. Can I add something to this? Just because I sat on the Phoenix Planning Commission for a long time, mm -hmm. and in Phoenix, of course, we have pear orchards, we have abandoned orchards, and there's always been a county staff person yeah. that deals with the blight issues or a negotiated settlement if there's a conflict between two orchardists. That same very same person would have that very same job in this instance if there were some instance where something had to be mitigated. Right. So it's so already a funded position. It would just be one more field, one more. But also, if the county chose to do that, because the county does, right. has discretion and could choose not to do anything exactly. About but it. if and there was, a, as a landowner, could take action if you wanted to do that, if you felt that you, there's there's laws against frivolous lawsuits in Oregon, so we're protected against somebody just you know saying I'm going to sue you for something. Um, so, but if you had reasonable cause to believe that uh, Syngenta or Monsanto are you know within miles of you and they're damaging your crop and you want to risk taking them to court, you better be darn sure because you're going to be taking one of the biggest, largest chemical companies in the world to court. But if you think that you want to do it, you can go for it. No, and that's, that's what I'm saying. If uh -huh. they've got that edge, who's going to take us to well, court? They're well, breaking, they're breaking the law. So the, now they wouldn't yeah. be because they're, they're, uh, they're uh, a protection. They have a protection act against patents. That's why now, even though um, a genetically engineered crop next to me can ruin my whole, ruin his whole livelihood for the year, my livelihood for the year, I can't do anything about it because they have a, they are protected by the patent law. But now when the measure passes, they won't be protected because it will be, it will be not legal in this county to grow anymore. So let's talk about who's actually growing. Um, you know, who is that? The majority is this chemical company, Syngenta, growing sugar beets. Not a food, but uh, I think we can. Go ahead, please. I was looking at a Jackson County website, and they addressed that issue as to what would be the driving force, because you see some of these commercials that say that there would be crop police, and they would be driving around looking at to try to determine if a crop was GMO which you can't do by visual inspection. Right. <laughs> so that would be rather stupid to have somebody drive around and look for something that you can't, can't tell. See. <laughs> they yeah. said it would be driven by a complaint and that the problem being would be that they have no qualified people because there are currently no uh, testing facilities to test whether there are genetically modified the plant would be a complaint was given. I think that guy, you know, is not going to be the Salem witch on. But then they said, okay, even though the county would bear the money, they have a remedial uh, source to get the money back two ways. One, they said, the, whoever crafted the language in the, in the proposal crafted it after the solid waste section which they ruled with Prop 50 to be illegal, but they also have means for making 
the person personally liable for that would be found guilty of violating the section so that even though the county would have to bear the money up front, they could have seek recourse through uh, essentially A, finding somebody and then holding them personally liable for um, do in breaking that law. So they said it may be no money or it may be some money that comes up front and then later is recouped or they really don't know. So, I mean, I don't know that you, they, but they did say that the county commissioners would have the deciding vote as to whether they choose to run abatement or have people go around spot checking. So again, um, it's just completely political agenda. It's there, the county has discretion whether they want to enforce this. The county has discretion whether they want to enforce jaywalking. How many people see people jaywalking all the time? Do we have people out there ticketing every jaywalker? It doesn't happen, right? So it's the same thing with any other uh, law we have in place. The county has discretion on how they want to enforce it, how they want to spend their money. If they don't want to spend a dime on this measure, they don't need to. So don't say it's going to cost money. It's not going to take place money from schools or libraries, even if it was the same funding, because it's not, so let's get that straight, right? Um, it's not take, going to cost any money if the Chiap County doesn't want to. If they want to decide they want to have some police patrol, that's their decision to do that. It's completely ridiculous. In Oregon, actually, for $200, you can get genetically engineered testing, so it's not super expensive. And, um, you know, so there's there's all kinds, it's just, even getting into the cost of it is just so ridiculous because it's at the discretion. The county doesn't have to spend any money. We looked at other counties that have double the agricultural sales that we have, if not even more, and they've had no costs. So. You have that comment from yeah. I want to say something about the new commercial that came out saying that it's going to take money away from our sheriff's department. Our sheriff's department's funding is already set by our property taxes. Yes. They, they cannot divert funds away from the sheriff's yeah. department. That is fixed. It is already there. It's just up to the sheriff to manage his funds. And whether they do that or not, you know, I know Mike Winters personally. He is a good guy. He is a good farmer. But what he doesn't do is properly our spend our money. He is diverting our resources to other counties looking for these marijuana grows. Yeah, I don't believe in growing pot. I don't think it's right. But that doesn't mean that he needs to waste our money going to other counties to do it. We don't have money just like those other counties don't have money. It's all about managing the money that you have. We have a question over there. Uh, well, I, I at least addressed it at another meeting, but I, I'd like the information to come out here. Uh, how uh, I know that Marin County in particular has been GMO free now for 10 years. Mm -hmm. And how has it affected the farmers economically during that time? Right, so and that's the good news of it that we don't hear, right, is all the economic boosts. And Jared talked about it. Uh, agricultural scale uh, sales has skyrocketed in areas where these, um, the prohibition of uh, genetically engineered crops have 700 times the amount, right? Sales have gone up. People, you look at grape nuts, Cheerios, they won't buy genetically engineered crops. The market, the international market, Europe, Asia, all of the U.S. is saying, the consumers are saying, we don't want genetically engineered food. So that's why the sales have gone up so much. When this place becomes a you know seed sanctuary, um, seed is such a, an incredible industry. We are in, so fortunate to have this land to be able to grow seed in. If you look on that back chart over there, those uh, red circles are the chemical companies that have actually donated to this campaign. They're paying to falsely advertise to you about this measure. Um, those are the people that are, are trying to get this measure not passed. And why? Because they have bought all these seed companies up and they sell chemicals that are promoting this kind of genetically engineered growing. So it's, you know, I don't know, got off topic. But anyways, yeah, it's the, the sales and the industry has skyrocketed in areas that it's passed. I'm looking forward to it. Okay. Uh, another point, uh, I have a comment on that. It is that we have to check in other countries, almost everywhere in the world, 
GMO is leveled, but many countries are banning GMO. Mm -hmm. India, Poland, now, last week, Russia, a minister in Russia, he says that they have enough resources to grow organic food and that they don't need GMO. And you can research it in, in Google and you will see what he says, you know? So everywhere in the world, they are against GMOs. Only these countries, the one, the, the first consumers of GMOs in the world, in the world, and they are trying to sell overseas these GMOs, but no one wanna buy them in other countries anymore. Because and you can see that every day, if you go now to Detroit, if you go now to, to Seattle, if you go to anywhere in the US, there will be people who are trying to get rid of GMOs. So we are no este, ahead from other people. We all are thinking and feeling the same. This is a huge movement, a global movement. So I have, she has a question, and I think that our time is almost gone. She has a question? And this is from the stupid question department. Let's pretend that I'm a crooked farmer, and I got a hold of GMOC. I've not signed a contract, and I'm planning it because I'm going to save money on pesticides. How much money are we talking about that would motivate me to do something like that? There is no savings. <laughs> but they say that you are going to save money on pesticides. My pesticide use increased. Just because the pesticides are only 10% of your traditional pesticides, well, when you have to apply it 10 times as much, you're back to the same level you were and you've put more uh, pesticides into the environment. And, and it, what, one more thing on that though is you, if you are violating your patent uh, use contract by selling your seeds, I have leftover Roundup seed, a ready alfalfa seed. I cannot sell it and it's very expensive. I have $15,000 of Roundup ready alfalfa seed. I cannot sell and I'm not going to plant it. And it's because I'm not building for this. That will destroy me. She has a question, and we have another here, the last one, I think. So I have just a couple of quick comments. One is um, regarding the, uh, the influence of Monsanto in particular, but these chemical companies on our laws. And that is, um, that's sort of a corrupt thing. I mean, it, what I'm, um, if I want to participate in the Nielsen studies for TV ratings, one of the questions they ask you is, um, are you uh, an employee of any of these networks, et cetera, et cetera? And if you are, you cannot participate in the Nielsen ratings. So somehow in our government, this is, the, this is what the corruption is, in my opinion. The corruption is that we have allowed people who have the vested interest in the Monsanto and the other chemical companies to take positions of tremendous influence in our government. And that is the problem because then they they speak from a poisoned source. The other thing I want to say is um, I have a, my work history includes being uh, having a degree in biochemistry, biotechnology, and uh, I loved that for many reasons and went into healthcare. But one of the reasons was it really was disturbing to me that the bioengineering of crops and my degree is from 1985. So. It was a pretty new field at the time. But what bothered me was the very idea that you could have these bioengineered crops, so I understand in great detail how that all works. And I did work in that industry, not with, with plants, but I did work in that industry for a few years. And so I understand how it works, and the only way that I think it is safe to do that research is if it is contained so that the pollen cannot get in plants. Mm -hmm. And I want to thank all of you that, are, that have stayed with that and stayed in that, those positions to do the good science and, and come and show us how, how that transgene has, has migrated and how that pollen is infecting this area so that we can see the influence that that has happened. So thank you very much for the work with that. Thank you so much. Well, I got a question. Are there any good GMO crops? Um, it, how would you define a good GMO crop? I, uh, I'm asking you to define that. I'm going to leave that up to you. Are there any crops, any any plants out there that's been genet, genet, genetically 
modified or engineered that is a good crop, that's good for humanity in the world. So can I say something that's just uh, is that I, 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 I talked to somebody about this today, and I, I really believe strongly that this measure isn't about you deciding or me deciding whether genetically engineered crops are good or bad. They're about whether they're right for this valley. And this valley is the way it's, you can't change the way it's structured geologically. It's narrow, it's windy, and there's no way that we can coexist and have different types of farming. It's either going to be so, genetically engineered or it's not. It's going to be all or nothing. So what you're so saying you decide, is I have to farm your way. No, I'm saying, you're, you're saying, is that the opposing <laughs> side saying, guess what? You're going to farm my way or you're going to break the law and we're going to take your farm down. And I'm not willing to let that happen. I feel like I have the right to farm with I want to farm and I don't have to pay money to a chemical company to get my seed. So I, I, I agree people with, have been growing for generations And like I this. agree with that. And so you can agree what you think, and I can agree what I think. And what people need to decide who don't farm is how will they envision this valley to be? What do they want to see it like? What do they want to live next to? What do they feel safe with? And that's what they need to sit with and decide. How about turn the question around? Why do you think GM crops are so good? Well, because it's a thing called golden rice, and it affects somewhere between a quarter and a half a million kids a year, keeps them from going blind. It also, because if there's adequate vitamin A out there that is available from this product, it is genetically modified, they can save the lives of two million people a year. So, I mean, all genetically modified. Where, where is your source for that? Yeah. What is your source? Uh, uh, let's let it be. Uh, 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 okay, yeah. Golden Rice, he's right. It exists, but it's actually an increase in um, vitamin A, and they wanted to uh, introduce it in, especially in Asian countries. Where, in Africa. Where, and, well, now they, they've switched into Africa. They first wanted to introduce it into Asian countries because it's a stable crop. The majority of the population eats rice every day. Um, that's correct. That's right. Correct. It has a trait that could be useful for humanity or for at least some um, troops. Um, and it wasn't developed by a chemical company. No, no. Yes, and there's other uh, transgenic developments that could potentially be useful um, for humanity. Either that they have increased uh, uh, nutraceutical, uh, let's say, um, um, chemical properties that can be uh, good for uh, eating, or, or they are trying to develop also some varieties that could uh, live, live in, in extreme situations or weather conditions. Um, and the golden rice was a good effort. Um, now, one of the biggest reasons why it was opposed in Asia, and that's why it was transferred to Africa, I was trying to introduce it there, is because uh, they found something that once they planted the uh, golden rice, the levels of vitamin A were not as high as expected as the ones they had tested in the lab, when they had the, in the greenhouse. Once they transferred it into the environment, it was not significantly higher. That was one thing. And we still don't know why, because again, this technology, we're kind of doing a, 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 a hit and miss approach. The technology is getting better, it's getting more precise, but it's still a hit and miss. And that's something that I think is very important to say. I've done transgenics, I've worked with transgenics during my PhD, and it's a hit and miss. And it's okay in the lab. Oh, in the lab, it's a secure environment, everything is shut down. They can find a line in particular that has something that is not useful or disturbing or whatever, you can just kill it. That's something that you cannot necessarily do when you go large scale and you introduce into the environment. Mm -hmm. That's one thing. So yeah, Golden Rice was a good example. They also are trying to put a vaccine, a vaccine into bananas. So they're trying to put bananas in the yeah, bananas. So people that eat a banana can get vaccinated against different things, uh, TV, for instance. That's still a problem, it's not okay. uh, So those are things that could be potentially good. But going back to the golden rice case, because it is a, an important case to discuss here, it, it didn't, for whatever reason that we still do not understand from the scientific point of view, it, 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 the levels of vitamin A, or a cursor of vitamin A, just decreased once they put them in the field, and it wasn't clear why. The second thing is there was opposition in Asia uh, to introduce golden rice over there for two reasons. Why? Because as any transgenic crop, it's an unguaranteed technology, and they were going to have gene flow from this golden variety into their rice, into their, their rice 
uh, varieties. I know that the Golden Rice was not under patent by Monsanto or a big corporation that was really going to screw over farmers right. in Asia. It was still it could still pose an ecological risk, and that was unacceptable for Asian countries. The other big discussion in the case of Golden Rice and to be um, extended to other crops that are um, promising to have increased nutraceutical properties, and I'm going to put it very bluntly, is they also were saying, you know, why do you want us to condemn us to poverty? Why do you want to do like dog food? Why do you want to have a single crop that I can eat and I'm going to get all my nutrition? Yeah. When, since the 1950s, all the physicians here and in other parts of the world know that the, 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 the core way to have a good, healthy life is having diversity in what you consume. So, you know, why do you want to, and, and also, as a level of fact, I mean, A and the uh, golden rice decrease, you would have to eat like a ridiculous amount of golden rice to really get like a significant increase in your vitamin A intake. But there was this other argument, which I think is something that maybe here in the U.S. is not a pressing subject because in general we have enough food for the population. But in other populations, this why are they condemning me to just eat a single crop from where I'm going to get nutrition when what should be stimulated is to have a diverse agriculture. Um, that, but golden rice is a good example of something that uh, transgenic technology is trying to be good. It still has ecological risks, in it, even if it has a very good intention. Banana, they want to do vaccines in banana, so you eat a banana and you get vaccinated. And they wanted to do this so they could take it to poor countries where transporting vaccines and cooler was unrealistic. So you could just plant the banana, eventually have it flower, eat the banana. But there was another problem. If you get, uh, I'm not saying that vaccines are, are bad. I think they are something that's necessary. But that's my personal opinion on vaccines. They have increased health. But one thing is to get vaccinated once, and the one is to just get vaccinated every day with a banana. So, <laughs> it's not the same thing for you. You get to know how. And once again, uh, Back to the discussion, you cannot differentiate visually or by any other means to a lay person when it's transgenic or it's not transgenic. So even if you say, I want to stay clear, clear from the transgenic bananas because I already have my vaccine this year, I'm probably going to end up eating it anyway. No? Um, so then that's those that are, I think they, they were good options. But currently, all the other technologies can maybe make farming easier in some cases, like glyphosate, because you can use but it. Not really, you see. Yes, because you can see the downfall of research. You know? And glyphosate is not as secure as it used to promote it. And we are finding mounting evidence on that. And sadly, we're finding that evidence once it's already in the field, it's already in the environment. You know? So the, the adequate testing was not done before it was a large scale, which we are going to suffer. That's it. It's going to be an option. The other technology, the cry partings, once again, it's not a sustainable technology because after three, four, five years, you're going to have resistance from those same bugs. So you're going to have to change into another country. And those cry partings that are produced by a, a, normally by a, a bacteria in the soil, and you put them into a plant, that plant is not produced from those uh, insecticidal proteins, they can affect other genetic organisms of, the, of, your, of your parcel. So not so good. Um, which would be maybe potentially good transgenics that I can think of, the ones that increase yield, not operative yield, no, not just for an infested something against an uninfested something because that's just a relative increase in yield, a real increase in yield, that are drought tolerant, that are freeze tolerant, uh, that are I don't know, something else that we can think of. I think those are pretty important traits everywhere. No? We all agree on those. Well, it turns out that there's no transgenics in those particular uh, traits because it's not a one gene, one trait situation. It's different genes that have to be in a particular genetic configuration in order to enhance yield, in order to uh, provide drought tolerance, in order to provide uh, freeze tolerance. So this technology is not gonna is not gonna get there. No? Not because they're not trying, just because they're finding it's really really difficult. Because you would have to transform about. 20, 50 genes, put them in the correct context, and then just pray that it works. Uh, that, I think those would be really useful, but it's not going to be through the, this generation of transgenics. So whenever you hear a promise that we're going to get there, that's not true. 
Let's say the science shows you that that's not true, even if you want it, it's not true. In the short term. Well, in the short term, but once again, <coughs> just imagine putting, so you put a transgene and you put a promoter in front of it because you want that transgene to be uh, activated all the time during the life cycle of a plant. That's how right. they work now. That's one thing. Then you put two transgenes, three transgenes, and you start having additive negative effects in the plant. And that's already something that's known in, in, um, in uh, basic research. That's why some of the companies like Monsanto and Synthetica, they always strive to have a single copy transgene. It's not because they're very meticulous. It's not because the technique is really specific or they only want to have a transgene. It's because they found practical reasons to do so. Because they've seen that when you increase the transgenic load, you have other problems with plants. Uh, because you're affecting the genetic network of the plants. Um, I don't think this technology is going to overcome that problem because it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a basic problem of, of approach. We have to think about the approaches. There's a lot of things in molecular biology that are very promising to really increase yields, to generate crops that are uh, drought tolerant and everything, but they're actually not going to come to the transgenic, transgenic approach. It's going to be hardcore bio, uh, molecular biology, but it's probably going to be in really efficient in selecting things and mapping what genes are affecting that. Lots of people are working for that goal, but there's still not Okay. Do you know I just want to take that here. Why are you getting to the stuff? Because they promised us an increase in yields and less application of pesticides. They increased more yields with less input costs. And that's something they, they don't they don't coerce you, they just tell you you're gonna get increased yields and you're gonna have decreased input costs. And that's that, that's what they're promising. They're saying you're going to turn the scales. You're going to be more profitable because of our crops. And that is not true. I, I cannot disclose. We've, we've had them since 2009. And we cannot disclose our production records because if I was to do that, I would be in violation of those patent rights. Mm -hmm. Yeah.